Um, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Gail Chapman. I'm the Public Programs Officer for the Royal College of Physicians Museum. Um, and I'm just doing a little bit of introductory things this evening and then we'll be handing over to our two speakers um, for tonight. Katie Burkwood, our Rare Books Librarian, and Felix Lancashire, our Archives Assistant. Okay, so that's probably enough from me, and we should get into the important part of the evening, um, which is the wonderful presentation, That Which Can Never Be Suppressed, LGBTQ plus history in the RCP collections. And I'll hand over now to our speakers for the evening, Katie Burkwood and Felix Lancashire. Hello, uh, hello everyone. Thank you, Gail. Um, so yes, uh, this evening, Katie and I are going to be sharing with you some uh, items from our library, archive and museum collections that hopefully tell us something about the lives uh, and experiences of LGBTQ plus people um, in the past, both doctors and non-doctors. Um, and also about attitudes towards um, sexual and gender diversity. Uh, so the attitudes of the Royal College of Physicians and of the wider medical establishment and of society generally. Um, so for anyone not familiar with the Royal College of Physicians, we are a registered charity uh, with the aim of improving health and health care for all. Um, we work with doctors and patients in order to do that. We were set up by Henry VIII in 1518 to license doctors and to set standards in medical education and practice. Um, and setting standards is something that we still do today. So we represent about 40,000 doctors around the world, um, working in 33 different specialties. So that's things like cardiology, neurology, geriatric medicine, uh, air and space medicine, and so on and so on. And while most of us can probably agree that setting standards in medicine is in and of itself uh, a good thing, um, this is really not what the establishment of the RCP in 1518 was about. Um, it was about monopolizing the practice of medicine for a select group of people and excluding everyone else. So, for example, women were prevented by law from practicing medicine and the RCP uh, enforced that law for the first 400 or so years of its existence. Um, we didn't admit women until 1909. Um, and whereas before 1518, any man could practice as a doctor, when the RCP was set up, there was a rule introduced that you had to have a degree from Oxford or Cambridge. So therefore you had to be a relatively wealthy man. Um, and also we made it very difficult for anyone who wasn't an English national to uh, get a license. So effectively the only people who could practice medicine were wealthy white men. So in this context, the RCP has always been a pro-establishment, socially conservative organisation, and this is also reflected in its attitude to LGBTQ plus issues. Um, if everyone uh, is able to mute their microphones, that would be that would be really helpful. It's in the top left-hand corner of the um, uh, of the screen. Um, so a few important things to say before we get started. Um, as we know, one of society's approaches to queer people is to medicalize them, uh, to treat the beautiful diversity of human sexuality and gender as um, a medical issue requiring treatment. Um, and since we are a medical organization, uh, a lot of what we have in our collections is from that perspective. Um, we've tried in this talk to cover as broad a range of queer experience as our collections allow. But given the nature of the collections, there will inevitably be uh, a focus on medicalized issues. Um, and most of the material we've got is from the doctor's point of view. So it represents the medical establishment commenting on the lives of queer people. Uh, we don't tend to have first-hand accounts of queer people themselves, uh, although this is something we are looking to remedy. Some of the material we'll be looking at is potentially upsetting. Um, and much of it uses language that we wouldn't use ourselves. But despite uh, all of these caveats, we are this evening going to be meeting some very inspiring individuals and hearing uh, the positive stories that they have to tell. Um, and so the last thing that I'll say here is that um, our aim with this talk is to be as inclusive as possible, to cover as broad a range of human, sexual and gender expression as possible. Um, so 
we've been happy to include anyone and any experience that falls outside of a very rigid heteronormative idea of straight cis experience. Uh, a heteronormative narrative that is one of the tools used by the powerful to divide the working class. And now uh, Katie is going to introduce us to the first individuals we'll be meeting this evening. Thanks Felix and thanks everyone for being here tonight. Um, we're going to start this evening in the 17th century and work forwards in time right up to the present day and to what we're hoping to do for the future. So we're going to start with some of the great treasures of the Royal College of Physicians Museum collection. These are 17th century preserved anatomical dissections of human bodies made in the Italian university city of Padua. They show the nervous system and the circulatory systems. These tables were owned by John Finch, who may even have been the man who made them. John Finch met Thomas Baines at Christ's College, Cambridge in around 1645, when they were both students there. Baines and Finch became an inseparable couple and spent the next 16 years, sorry, the next 36 years in what Finch called a beautiful and unbroken marriage of souls, a companionship undivided. After studying in Cambridge, they travelled together to Padua in Italy to get their medical degrees. Padua was then a major centre of anatomical study and many English medics went out there to study and to qualify. We assume that these tables were made there because there was a very famous anatomical theatre and a lot of dissecting was going on. Finch then went on to be an English ambassador. He travelled to Tuscany and later to Turkey. Baines accompanied him on all these travels officially as his personal physician. The pair commissioned these joint portraits from the artist Carlo Dolci, and those are now displayed in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. Baines died in Turkey in 1680, and Finch arranged for his remains to be returned to England and buried back in Christ's College where they'd studied. Two years later, Finch's own body joined that of his life partner. Their family friend, Hennage Daring, described the events in his own autobiographical notes. And it's really striking how matter of fact he was about their then unconventional relationship. He wrote, in November died Sir John Finch. He was newly returned from his embassy in Constantinople with a design to spend the rest of his days in England. In the summer, he buried his dear friend and the companion of his life, Sir Thomas Baines, in the chapel of Christ's College, where they first grew acquainted. He had brought his body from Constantinople where he died. He was buried beside his friend not long after in the same chapel. This is the memorial to them at Christ's College. The elaborate marble monument is inscribed with a long epitaph which refers to their outstanding undying friendship and begins with these words. Speak, Marble. Who are these two heads that you support? Two of the most loving friends whose hearts and souls were one, Dr. John Finch and Dr. Thomas Baines. It's really easy to think that the history of happy gay relationships is very short, and it's salutary, I think, to see this example and to learn that in fact, at least for a few happy people, it isn't. The following century, George Edwards wrote in a rather surprising place about the flip side, the risks to people perceived not to be straight. George Edwards, who you see here, was an 18th century naturalist and ornithologist who created seven gorgeously illustrated volumes of natural history. He was a fellow of the Royal Society and Bedell of the Royal College of Physicians, meaning its custodian in charge of property and administration and also its librarian. In his second work, called Gleanings of Natural History, he wrote an extended preface filled with his comments and observations on all sorts of topics. Included in this is a lengthy, about 800 words, so three pages in the folio book, digression that starts on the subject of the behaviour of male partridges and quickly becomes an assessment of the causes and effects of same-sex attraction. In summary, his argument goes like this. When kept together with no female partridges present, male partridges start trying to mate with each other. This is a bit like young people who are kept segregated in single sex schools. This being done to them at a time of emotional and developmental vulnerability means that they develop desires for those who are, 
who are available to them, i.e. members of the same sex. This, he says, may be the reason that some adults eschew marriage for their whole lives. Such unnatural, he says, acts that those people uh, partake in are then punished by governments through the legal system with very, very harsh punishments very often. And that makes the people experiencing those desires or suspected of experiencing them ripe for blackmail by crafty servants and villains who trick them into revealing something of their nature in order to extort money from them. So there's a whole lot going on in there. There's class issues, there's ideas about educational standards, there's ideas about psychological development. We haven't got time to cover any of those now, sadly. But it's interesting that in a 1992 biography of Edwards, all of this uh, description and the very um, emotive way he describes it of the perceived danger of same-sex schools, um, along with er Edwards' own unmarried state, is all put together to conclude that he may, and I quote, Edwards may himself have been a homosexual and experienced blackmail. That is hard to establish from the evidence we have available, but it's certainly notable and a striking discussion of, of same-sex attractions from the 18th century and a remarkably sympathetic one, again, all things considered. I don't think that we can say the next document is so remarkably sympathetic and Felix is going to talk to you about that. Oh, I forgot to show you my next slide. Sorry. There you go. There is a partridge um, and some of Edward's text. Um, and this will be going up on YouTube so you can come back and read that text then. And I'll skip ahead to Felix's bit now. Thank you. Um... So I mentioned in my introduction that uh, the RCP, like the whole of society, uh, was set up to safeguard the hegemony of wealthy white men. Um, and the individuals that we've met so far, John Finch, Thomas Baines and George Edwards, uh, all broadly fit this description. Um, so let's look now at a, uh, at a document from 1830 which, although uh, this is written by a male doctor, it may nevertheless contain some insights into the experiences of the young working class woman who he's writing about. So John Lavies is the doctor's name. Um, and these are his notes on an unnamed teenager who might today describe herself as intersex and whom Lavies describes as hermaphrodite. Um, I should acknowledge that um, plenty of intersex people don't consider intersex to come under the LGBTQ umbrella. Um, but as I've said, with this talk, we are open to including anyone who might be excluded from a, a very rigid heteronormative view of uh, what a human being is. Um, I'm going to be using um, female pronouns when talking about this individual because, according to this document, uh, she always lived as a woman and there's no evidence that she identified as male or non binary. Uh, Lavies consistently uses male pronouns to describe her, despite saying she has lived as a female all her life. So um, we know very little about um, the life of this person, except that, as Lavies says, she was educated as a female and worked as a household servant. Lavies says she had this job up to the period of coming under my observation, and he later ambiguously refers to the circumstances that brought him under my care. So I'm not sure if this implies that the individual lost her job because of being intersex and has been compelled to see a doctor rather than choosing to. Uh, so it doesn't, doesn't seem as if she chose to uh, uh, be under Lavies' care. Um, and there's also the suggestion in this document that um, she may have experienced some form of sexual assault uh, or other traumatic event. Um, like our modern queer phobic society, Lavies is obsessed with genitals. Um, and insists on examining the genitals of this young girl, despite the distress he's clearly causing her. So he writes here, um, in all the interviews I had, there was much difficulty in obtaining permission to examine the parts. Indeed, he shed tears and hid his face. And while Lavies is clearly not being particularly uh, sensitive when dealing with um, this young person, um, I am struck by some of the nuance and insight uh, that nevertheless come through. So, for example, Lavies talks about feminine manners being acquired through the individual's upbringing and education. Lavies' idea of what constitute feminine manners uh, are predictably reactionary, 
emotional vulnerability, which Lavies appears to dismiss as hysterics. But nevertheless, I find it fascinating that we have here a doctor in 1830 acknowledging that gendered behaviours are not necessarily inherent, but socially constructed, something that the queerphobic and particularly the transphobic lobby continue to deny today. Um, we have no way of knowing anything about the life of this particular young woman. Um, as I say, she isn't even named in the document uh, after her encounter with Lavies. Um, I always read far too much into archive documents like this, but there is the slight suggestion that she becomes more confident in the course of her meetings with Lavies. And this gives me hope that she continued that trend and was able to live a fulfilling life as she appears to have been doing before society's prejudices got in the way. Um, and speaking of defying society's gender boundaries, uh, Katie has more on that for us now. Thanks, Felix. So the trial of Thomas Ernest Bolton and Frederick William Park was a celebrated scandal in Victorian England. Bolton and Park also used the names Stella Clinton and Fanny Winifred Park. They were members of a group of young men in London who enjoyed dressing in women's clothing at home and out in town, performing in drag theatrical entertainments, and who also had romantic and sexual relationships with men. They were arrested by the police on the 28th of April 1870 as they left the Strand Theatre, charged that they had committed buggery, i.e. anal sex, with each other, that they had conspired together as a group to do the same with other people, and that they had outraged public decency and corrupted public morals by disguising themselves as women and going out in public dressed like that. What's on the screen here is a two Tupney news pamphlet called The Life and Examination of the Would-Be Ladies, which was printed shortly after the end of the initial hearing at Bow Street Magistrates Court in May 1870. It plays directly to public desire for scandal, gossip and salacious detail, providing elaborate descriptions of the dress and appearance of the defendants it describes as England's gems in petticoats. Uh, with these completely unflattering portraits of the two defendants in different dress on the cover. A key part of the evidence brought at the full trial before the Queen's Bench in 1871 was the testimony of several physicians and surgeons on the question of the sexual acts that may have been committed. Medical examinations took place at Bow Street Police Station and at Newgate Jail in extremely unpleasant conditions. A police surgeon asserted that his examination revealed that there had been, quotes, frequent unnatural connections. However, other experts were called for the defence and all testified that they had seen no evidence to suggest that unnatural intercourse had taken place. One of those experts was Alfred Swain Taylor, a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians, sometimes known as the father of forensic medicine. The question of how to identify evidence of sexual activity of different kinds was covered in Taylor's own manual on medical jurisprudence, uh, which was the standard textbook on the subject and ran to many editions. The full trial took place amid a frenzy of public interest. The charge of sodomy was dropped because of the inconclusive medical evidence. This left Bolton Park and six of their associates charged with conspiring and inciting persons to commit an unnatural offence i.e. that they had been dressing as women in order to solicit men for sex. The act of men dressing as women was in itself demonstrated not to be a crime and the evidence brought by the prosecution failed to demonstrate that any conspiracy had taken place. The jury only took 53 minutes to return a verdict of not guilty on all counts and all the accused were freed. This case is extremely interesting for the confluence of different topics guaranteed to excite public indignation, both then and now. Prostitution, cross-dressing, the perceived interrelation of gender identity and sexual orientation, sex between men, the reliability or otherwise of medical experts. And I think it's um, particularly nice that we have this quite grubby, scandalous report of the trial in our collection because it's part of the collection of um, tracts and pamphlets that Alfred Swain Taylor himself put together as part of his kind of bank of information on the subject of medical forensics. <clears throat> so moving from two people assigned male at birth, I don't know how Fanny and Stella Bolton and Park chose to identify if they had the opportunity to use the terms we have today. 
um, to the subject of sex between women. That famously was never directly criminalised in the UK. And sexological studies of the later 19th century, which were quite a boom industry, um, such as passages in Swain Taylor's own textbook, similarly tend to focus more on sexual activity between men than between women. However, lesbian or sapphic attractions do sometimes get a mention. For example, in Richard von Kraft Ebbing's monumental textbook, Psychopathia Sexualis, uh, in its 1895 English edition, um, lesbianism is described as, of late, quite the fashion, partly owing to novels on the subject and partly as a result of excessive work on sewing machines, the sleeping of female servants in the same bed, seduction in schools by depraved pupils, or seduction of daughters by perverse students, sorry, by perverse servants. It's not known if any of those supposed causes came into play in the lives of the next couple I'd like to mention. Um, and it is interesting that that very salacious description of love between women um, contrasts very strongly with the way these two women were talked about. This textbook of anatomy and physiology for nurses from 1894 was a hugely successful textbook designed specifically for the needs of nursing students rather than for physicians or surgeons. I happened to start researching the history of this book because a copy of a much later 11th edition from about 50 years later um, was donated to the library a few years ago. And I found that the first edition had this dedication in it. Affectionately dedicated to my friend, schoolmate and superintendent, Louise Darsh. And that word affectionately got me digging a bit further. The book's author was Diane Clifford Kimber. She studied nursing at Bellevue College, Washington State, and was appointed superintendent of the Illinois Nurses Training School after that. But she gave up that post to go and join Louise Darsh, another nurse in New York. And here they both are. Darsh was a year above Kimber at Bellevue College. She swiftly became superintendent of the New York City Training School for Nurses on Welfare Island, aptly named, now known as Roosevelt Island, in New York City. She held that post from 1888 to 1898. Then she had to leave the role through ill health and Kimber took it over for the rest of the academic year and then moved with Darsh to her home country of England to nurse her through the illness that led to her death the following year in 1899. The book Early Leaders of American Nursing wrote of them. The loyal devotion of these women to each other and to the highest ideals of human betterment resulted in such close cooperation that the work of one is almost inseparable from that of the other. And up to the time of Miss Darsh's death, they were constantly together and all the love and skill Miss Kimber was so capable of were lavished on her friend until the last. Darsh and Kimber were clearly really well regarded in the American nursing world, described also as two women whose names are written large in the history of nursing education, and a scholarship fund was set up in honour of them at the training school they had run. Now, it's really difficult researching queer history queer figures from history because we can never get inside their heads. We never know precisely what sort of relationships they have. But I love couples like this who are written about so warmly by their fellows um, and who are clearly doing something to queer the idea that women have to get married and have families and kids and that they can't um, go on and have careers and live together in whatever kind of relationship they were having. Um, so I love them very much. Um, other people, I think, loved this man very much. He's less to my tastes. This is Eugen, Eugene, Eugen, I never know how to say his name, Sando. He was German originally, so Eugen, I guess, if German. Here is a sample of the illustrations from his book, Life is Movement, a book which is all about how to get hench using stretches and exercises, illustrated with photographs of the author himself, as well as lots of photographs sent in by his devotees around the world. Sando made a name as a muscle man and the so-called father of bodybuilding. And I think there's a weightlifting prize or something still named after him. He performed on stage in the UK and the USA and had a big following for whom he published photographs, magazines and books showing off his body and explaining his theories of movement for health. 
At least in the earlier part of his career, in the late 19th century, Sandow was fairly open about being in a relationship with a man, the pianist Martina Siefking, with whom he lived in New York. And his publications, though dressed up as health advice, definitely played to an audience that was keen to see revealing images of oiled up male bodies. In fact, this book, subtitled as A Family Encyclopedia of Health, um, has actually found its way into a medical library, presumably because of its connection to the sort of movement therapy that might be recommended to people living with or at risk of rheumatological conditions like arthritis. Did anyone really take at face value its suggestion that it's a health manual, given that these images of rippling masculinity are quite undeniably homoerotic? Again, it's difficult to know. I love the, uh, the sort of tension of it sitting in a medical collection, but I'm sure it was bought by a lot of men who just wanted to ogle the pictures, and why not? Um, but moving from the study of the physical body to the study of the mind, uh, we come to Havelock Ellis, who wasn't quite such a rippling example of virile masculinity. He is a very well-known figure in queer history for being an early theoretician of sex writing in English. He was trained as a physician and was made a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians towards the end of his life. He authored the book Studies in the Psychology of Sex, an ultimately seven volume magnum opus about human sexuality in its various forms, first published in the 1890s. One volume was dedicated to sexual inversion, which was Ellis's preferred term for same sex attraction. And it was the first serious su study of the subject published in Britain. Ellis's belief was that it was important to talk about sex and sexuality in all its forms, rather than to repress and hide that knowledge. In the general preface to the book, he writes, in this particular field, i.e. the problems of sex, the evil of ignorance is magnified by our efforts to suppress that which never can be suppressed, though in the effort of suppression, it may become perverted. He also recognised that people viewed unfavourably by society are going to find it hard to live happy lives. And we know that today um, queer people have disproportionately high rates of mental ill health and that those rates go up for people as they are more marginalised. So um, people who have intersectional identities are more likely, again, to have uh, poor mental health by people, again, more so, and trans people. Uh, most of all, which I think is quite easy to trace to the levels of discrimination and frankly hatred that are still out there. Ellis's overall message in his book is that homosexuality is congenital, i.e. people are born gay, and that it should not be considered a sin, a crime or a physical or mental disease. This sounds quite enlightened, but his overall conclusion was that society shouldn't be expected to, quote, tolerate the invert who flouts his perversion in its face, um, but that society might well refrain from crushing inverts with undiscerning ignorance beneath a burden of shame. Essentially, it's a long-winded way of saying, well, I guess it's okay if they don't shove it in our faces, which was a phrase that I have heard an awful lot throughout my life. And Havelock Ellis was an advocate for eugenics and stated that inverts are better off not having children because they represent a, quote, neurotic and failing stock. So whilst he's a very famous name in queer history, he is not um, an unequivocally good thing, I'd have to say. And I'm going to hand over to Felix um, to take this topic rather further. Yes, I'm afraid we're sticking with uh, the subject of eugenics for uh, a bit. Um, so, uh, the silver plate in the slide I'm now bringing up, um, is part of our museum collection, um, and it belonged to haematologist and RCP fellow John Frederick Wilkinson. Um, he was given it in 1962 when he retired from, uh, Manchester Royal Infirmary, um, so it's got the engraved signatures of his colleagues there who are wishing him a happy retirement. Um, among Wilkinson's research interests was hormone treatment and it was Wilkinson who gave Alan Turing, pictured here, his first hormone injection as part of the chemical castration process 
uh, that Turing was subjected to. Um, I'm sure uh, most of us here are familiar with Alan Turing, a computer scientist who used his skills to help Britain be on the winning side in the Second World War. Um, but despite this, the same British state that had been so aided by Turing uh, responded by maiming and mutilating him for the crime of being gay. Um, in this same post-war period, um, while Britain was getting on with persecuting gay people, the RCP was asked to help investigate medical war crimes carried out by the Nazis at concentration camps and in other settings. Um, so the records of uh, this committee um, include testimony from survivors and witnesses to these crimes, and they provide horrible detail about the suffering caused, which I won't go into here, but I will just highlight one of the many, many crimes, which was the forced hormone treatment of gay men. This is a report um, written by RCP fellow Charles Lovett Evans on his findings on this crime. Um, so I'll read out a bit of it. So he's answering a series of um, set questions that aren't printed here, but um, uh, I will read them. Um, so question A is, uh, what was the object of the experiment? The object was to find whether the sexual attitude of homosexuals can be normalized by implanting artificial male sexual gland. Experiments were made at Weimar Buchenwald on five men, two castrated, one sterilized, two not previously operated. It was also hoped to find the cause of homosexuality. Question B is, was the object of the experiment a reasonable one, to which Evans writes, yes, but the idea was not original. If we skip to question F, which is um, what conclusions were derived, Evans says it was concluded that cures were affected. And question J is, um, was it imperative to use human beings as subjects in order to obtain the answer to the question with which the experiment was designed to deal? And Evans writes, yes, human beings had to be used. Such cases are usually voluntary and in course of treatment. So there's lots here that demonstrates Evans' presumably mainstream views on homosexuality. He talks about normalizing gay people, by which he presumably means turning them straight, which he describes as a reasonable thing to seek to do. He uses the word cure, so he's clearly talking about homosexuality as a disease. And he says these sorts of procedures would usually be voluntary. Well, they certainly weren't voluntary in Alan Turing's case or in the case of thousands like him. So while um, the fascist government in Germany was able to unrestrainedly implement the eugenic policies of the bourgeoisie, these same ideas were just as prevalent in Britain at the time. So here on the screen, we have some papers of the euphemistically named Voluntary Sterilization Committee, which was a committee of RCP physicians. While they don't specifically discuss homosexuality, these papers underline what we've seen with Havelock, Ellison, ha Havelock Ellis' position on um, gay people having children, and later the state's castration of gay men like Alan Turing, this assumption that the establishment class should be able to control the bodies and reproductive lives of ordinary people. So here's a memo from the committee from 1938, uh, which says marriage between a normal person and an exhibitor of a recessive abnormality should in the first place be discouraged. But when they have taken place, a decision as to sterilization should be based upon the gravity of the abnormality in question and the consequent undesirability of the recessive gene being spread and upon the other qualities shown by the families of the two people concerned. If these families were markedly subnormal, it might on balance be desirable that the two people concerned were childless. A grave abnormality such as deaf mutism of one partner would justify sterilization in such a mating. It would certainly be justified in a mating between an exhibitor of a recessive abnormality and a person who was suspected of being a carrier. So here it's um, deaf people that are singled out, but the committee also sought to trample the rights of poor people and people with mental disabilities. Rather than build an inclusive society that empowers all its members, the establishment is concerned only with extracting the most labor out of the population for the lowest cost and with blaming certain sections of the working class for society's perceived ills. 
Um, one person who I hope would broadly have recognized that the liberation of gay people can only come with the liberation of the entire working class was um, this man, Cecil Belfield Clark. Um, Clark, who was gay, was a licentiate of the Royal College of Physicians and became London's first black district medical officer in 1936. He was also a political activist and a proponent of pan-Africanism. So he recognized that all black and global majority people, wherever they lived in the world, had a common enemy in imperialism and that their liberation depended on a united struggle against imperialism. He was a medical advisor to the government of Ghana after it gained independence, formal independence from Britain in 1957. And um, there's a letter on the screen that he wrote to the British Medical Journal um, urging British doctors to go and work in Ghana to plug the gap while the country built up its medical infrastructure, uh, including the ability to train its own doctors. So he knows his audience. He's attempting to appeal to the bourgeois instincts of British doctors by telling them that they'll have all the comforts of home. Um, and I particularly like his use of the word misfits right at the end here. We are not seeking misfits, he says. Um, so here we have someone who society would have done its absolute best to other due to his ethnicity, immigrant status, sexuality and politics. Um, but I feel like he is here uh, tacitly dismissing the concept of a misfit because he's saying, well, you know, you can choose to describe a British doctor who chooses to work in Ghana as a misfit, if you like. But we're talking here about people who want to work for a better future for humanity. Um, we're going to fast forward now to um, the 1980s and 90s. Um, I don't want to uh, reduce the experiences of gay people at this time to the subject of HIV and AIDS, but it was, of course, a disease that heavily affected the gay community um, and, of course, still affects the lives of thousands of um, queer and straight people in Britain today. The earliest mention of AIDS in the RCP Council Minutes is in 1987. This was three years after the identification of the HIV virus and almost six years after the first AIDS-related death in Britain. So it seems to have taken a very long time for the RCP to show any interest in this major healthcare issue. Um, of course, this is not to say that individual physicians weren't taking an interest and weren't conducting research. They absolutely were. But the RCP as a body did not show any uh, official interest until six years into the ap epidemic. And while the RCP um, acted with indifference, the government was actively exploiting the epidemic to stoke fear and division in society. So by 1993, the Department of Health um, was pushing for um, patients who had been in contact with um, healthcare professionals who were HIV positive to be contacted and sent this letter. So this is this template letter that the Department of Health is recommending, um, informing uh, the patient that they've been in contact with uh, an HIV positive healthcare worker. The RCP, to its credit on this occasion, uh, pointed out that there had never been a single recorded case anywhere in the world of somebody contracting HIV uh, from a healthcare worker in a clinical setting. And that the only effect of receiving a letter like this would be to cause anxiety uh, in the person receiving it. Um, and also, of course, it would be a massive breach of the uh, healthcare worker's confidentiality. Um, it's perhaps not surprising that um, the RCP was slow to act when it came to adopting anything resembling a socially responsible stance on issues affecting the gay community when we listen to the following clip. Um, I'm going to play an excerpt, an excerpt from our collection of oral history recordings um, in which physician Michael Richards describes pre preparing for a job interview in 1986. I was prepared for the interview by a couple of the consultants at Barts, and they threw me out some questions about the fact that I'm a single person. Did, did I think being a single person mattered as a consultant? And after they'd done this mock interview, they said, you realise why we asked that? It's just in case they ask you anything that uh, asked whether or not you are gay, which I happen not to be, but none of anybody else's business and then a couple of days later they came to me and said 
actually, I don't think they will ask you questions like that. And I said, oh, well, why don't you think there's an accent now? Because they've asked us already. Now, that, of course, is utterly unacceptable. And I remember reporting this to a friend of mine who is gay, who went ballistic at, at the idea that those questions were being asked. But that was 30 plus years ago. And uh, I hope that would not even be an issue now. Well, um, I think we can all agree that we would hope uh, that this kind of incident wouldn't happen now. But of course, we're aware that institutional and systemic prejudice of all kinds is still widespread. Um, a recent RCP podcast that I've got the um, web address for on the screen there uh, highlights the health inequalities that queer people still face today. Um, but the clip that we've just heard, uh, I think, is very insightful in showing the blatant homophobia that physicians in the 1980s were exposed to. Uh, and we're very grateful to Dr. Richards for uh, letting us share it with you. Um, and speaking of um, sharing things, uh, all of the collections that we've looked at this evening, um, the Library Archive, Museum and Oral History collections, uh, are still being added to, but we need your help to do that. Um, so uh, we are currently working on a project to actively acquire material relating to HIV AIDS, but we would also love to collect material that speaks to all aspects of the lives of LGBTQ physicians and patients now and in the past. Um, so if you happen to have any uh, books, letters, diaries, documents or objects that are relevant in any way that you would be happy to donate, um, please do get in touch with us. Uh, we've got our contact details on the screen there um, and we can definitely share them later as well. Um, you can also sign up to our newsletter um, on, our, on our website uh, to get news of the, um, this upcoming uh, HIV AIDS collecting project and all of the activities that uh, the Archive Library Museum team are, are involved with. Um, when we do receive donations uh, into the collections, it's always really useful to get as much information as possible uh, from the donor about the items and the person they belong to, so as to better contextualize the donated items. Um, without this contextual information, it can be difficult to glean information about someone's sexuality, uh, even people from the relatively recent past. Um, and this brings us to Katie and the final individuals that we're highlighting this evening. Here I am. And here's Dorothy Hare. Dorothy Hare was the third woman ever to be elected as a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians. That's the senior level of RCP membership. And that took place for her in 1936. She had had an important medical career serving during the First World War and afterwards establishing hostels to treat young women with sexually transmitted infections including affected women who had children, who, as I'm sure you can imagine, in interwar England were a very stigmatised group who found it really hard to get medical care anywhere. After her death in 1967, um, as we do for all of our fellows after they die, the RCP commissioned an obituary to be written of Dorothy Hare, and another RCP fellow, Albertine Winner, took on that job. Winner corresponded with Hare's nephew, Ewan Hare, to check the details of Hare's life and her work. And in his letter back to her, Ewan commented um, uh, the following. It's quite a long quote, but I think it's worth reading in full. He said, I do not know to what extent a biography should contain connections with other people. But in this case, I feel that some mention should be made of Dr. Lepper, herself a distinguished person who undoubtedly played a very great part in Dorothy's life. They had lived together for a long time, both in their joint medical careers and in retirement. And I know that Dorothy was influenced very much by her companionship and wise counsel, though I am not sure to what extent their medical careers dovetailed. They were in fact inseparable. And Lesbia, which was a nickname for Elizabeth Lepper, accompanied Dorothy on all her travels. Though I knew Dorothy so well from my youth, it would, for many years have been difficult to think of one without the other and I feel that Lesbia should in some way be brought into the picture if you think it practicable if only with a mention that Dorothy would have wished this and I just love the fact that we have this letter 
because it, it means that we can really confirm that these two people who are described in the obituary um, as having retired together and lived together. I'm actually, I haven't written it in my notes, but I'm just going to check what the actual line in the obituary is. Oh, hang on a minute. Let that. Uh, she retired in 1937 to go round the world and then settled in Falmouth with her lifelong friend, Elizabeth Herdman Lepper, who was also a distinguished physician. And that's the sort of phrase we always are looking out for, these mentions of lifelong friend or long term companion or something like that. But being able to say definitely that, yes, this was a lovely romantic relationship is so valuable. Felix and I both share the, the wish that hopefully um, we won't. You know, we, we will live in a world where we don't have to make a fuss about the fact that people are in same sex relationships um, and that it won't be the sort of thing that gets mentioned in a coded way. It'll be the sort of thing that just gets slipped in almost so casually that, again, you stop noticing it. Um, but also having that information recorded somewhere is so valuable because it is vital that we document that these relationships have existed in the past and that they exist today because we never know what's coming around the corner. Um, and we need to stand up and be counted, frankly. Um, so without that letter that we've managed to keep in our records, the details of this relationship would likely have been lost to history. And it's a pleasure and an honour to be able to keep Lesbia in the picture, in this picture here with Dorothy, um, and for us to end our talk with them tonight.